My guest this week is Ryan H. Walsh. Ryan is a musician and writer from Boston, Massachusetts, and his debut book, Astral Weeks, A Secret History of 1968, was published by Penguin Press. It received rave reviews from The New Yorker, The Guardian, Rolling Stone, as well as being a New York Times end of the year critic's pick. His long-running band, Hallelujah the Hills, has won high praise from Spin, Aquarium Drunkard, and Pitchfork, and they've toured with acts like The Silver Jews and Titus Andronicus, while releasing seven full-length albums, as well as scores of singles, EPs, and experimental works. Their latest album, 2019's I'm You, was declared Album of the Year by Glorious Noise, a lyrical masterpiece by Metro, and received a 9 out of 10 at the line of best fit. And it is my pleasure to welcome to Revolutions Per Movie, Ryan H. Walsh. Hi, Chris. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Amazing to see you. I think that a lot of people are going to be very jealous with the film you picked. It is. Uh, <laughs> yeah, just snipe it early. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a high water mark, and it's a film that comes up a lot. Yeah. Um, because of, I don't know, it's just an amazing document of you know the '90s and of just feuding bands. So I'm just going to give a little background. We're going to talk today about the 2004 film Dig, uh, which is a documentary about the Brian Jonestown massacre, which was founded by. Anton Newcomb and the Dandy Warhols, who was a Portland band formed by Courtney Taylor. Taylor, I hate having to say the Taylor Taylor. He didn't used to be Courtney Taylor Taylor, but I'm going to respect it. And it was directed by Andy Timoner, who went on to uh, direct We Live in Public, which is another amazing documentary, and even did the, uh, the biopic Maplethorpe. But it's been interesting because both bands have written off the film. And I've been very critical of it. Right, yeah. And we'll get into that. But where where did you first see the film? Did you see it when it came out originally? Yes. I had friends who work in the indie movie world, did at the time, still do. And they were, they were, they forced me to go to the Boston premiere where Andy presented it. I remember her being there and doing a Q&A. So, you know, I saw the premiere, at least in Boston, when she was touring it. So, and and ever, I mean... As I rewatched it today, I can remember the lines that made the audience like lose it laughing or the one applause moment at the end. It was just like I still had it up here. It was very interesting. And, you know, just as an aspiring musician at the time, it's such an awesome cautionary tale. It's bonkers. And, you know, it's. I think it's do you, let me ask you if you agree. I think it's kind of easy if the band's good enough or interesting enough 20 years later to make a documentary just compiling all this footage but this is rarer where you just you're there at the right moment yes. you hit record yeah yeah it was interesting i was given a vhs tape of this originally it was going to be an mtv series it was not going to be a feature oh. and i thought it was amazing i was obsessed with it when i watched the film i'm still stuck in the mindset of seeing this um pilot and there's scenes that aren't in it, things where there's dialogue over it, you know, narration by Courtney Taylor Taylor. Instead of mm-hmm. just hearing Anton talk, you know, you have somebody talking over it. So yeah. it's a weird experience for me because I think they made it this amazing film, but for some reason it's like demoitis. Like the first thing I saw <laughs> yeah. was a thing yeah, I loved. Right. But I think it's a perfect documentary of its type, and there's not many films like it that are about um, competing bands that are in love with each other from the same kind of scenes and just how it spins off. Now, let me see this. Was the pilot edited in the same style? Because what you just said made clued me in. The editing style in the finished thing is MTV-esque to me. Yeah, the first episode ended with them getting, the Brian Jones Sound Massacre were getting pulled over by the police in Georgia. So it was like cliffhanger. Right, okay, you know, yeah, and but yeah. the footage was very um, quick editing. You're in San mm-hmm. Francisco now. You're in this room now. You're in a recording room now. It's the Danny Warhols, and it's kind of MTV style graphics of their band name with you know disco ball yes. imagery under it. It <laughs> yeah, was very much yeah. that, um, yeah. very much of the time. So um, I always wondered if th- they got funding from MTV, right, or if they pitched it and uh, they got a little you know, creation money to to kind of move this along because it's not that similar. So many bands were just being courted and given large amounts of money 
just to try stuff at this point still. I know, right? Yeah, the the, the checks were being free freely written. Were you a fan of either band before you went in? Were you familiar? Okay, so I remember I I was part of like I was probably uh, victim to the marketing that you here talked about, like the push of the Dandy Warhols was so intense. I remember as a teenager being like, yeah, I'm supposed to buy this now. <laughs> and, I, and I remember just buying and being like, yeah, like the single and not being, you know, taken or, or on board. And had never heard of the Brian Jonestown massacre. And this movie is like a perfect example of why bands with big catalogs, a good documentary is the perfect entry point for a band like this yes. because you can just play their bet the best parts of their best songs and contextualize it in a dramatic way it's just like i remember leaving that theater going i need all those i i need to find all those cds like this week i had the same thing yeah and the dandy warhols are definitely have some amazing singles like undeniably yeah. great pop songs but the brian jones sounds were like they were album bands they were like you had to kind yeah. of live in the albums to find the things you loved. And then things would grow on you that you may not have noticed, you know, because this was still in the era where you just had to own it. Right. And because it was on your shelf, you'd be like, ah, it was all right. But then I'll give it another try. And I'll listen to it again. Yeah. Yeah. Then it becomes your favorite thing. Yeah. But again, I think I liked the idea of both bands more than I liked the bands. True. And sometimes I'll like a band or an art, the story of an artist's life more than their art. And, you know, certainly, uh, at least for the dandies, like I enjoy seeing this, their trajectory in this movie, even though I'm not really fans of the music that much. When did you started, when did you start making records? Well, this came out in 2004. So yeah, I was already started, you know, with the, uh, with the before Hollywood of the Hills, it was the stairs and it was, um, and we were like halfway through a five-year thing. And um, yeah, just the the idea. I loved anytime I learned about like, you know, Guided by Voices. Anytime you learn about a band that just has this heap of material waiting for you. And you just get to wade through it. And you are, and part of the joy back then was like, you have to find it too. It's like, you have to, where does it, who sells this album? Um, so yeah, it was inspiring. Did you have... Any similar experiences from where the record industry was at that point? Because it was a pretty classic story. Yeah. We, no, we were like, the first time uh, I got signed was 2006 or seven. And mm -hmm. so then it was a whole new wave. It was the blog signings. If you remember, Chris, we're like, oh, I, I don't remember <laughs> the blog signings. Please fill me in. Well, it was just like in 2005, six, like, some random blogs rave about you was weighted equally with like Rolling Stone. Oh, like, I, like a pitchfork, you mean something like that? Oh, yeah. Or... Even smaller than that though. Like I just, I just remember like getting written about on five blogs and then having three or four, uh, uh, uh record deal offers. I mean, not by anybody huge, but Indies. So, um, but before that, no, it was all just, it totally independent, funded ourselves kind of thing. Right, yeah. right. I found watching the film this time, I haven't seen it in a while. I find I found some of it dramatically kind of sad. Yes, um, yeah. It's a it's a film that when I talk to people about it, I think we kind of go to the the laughter of it and the absurdity of it and the the, the just manic psychology of it. Right. But it's you know Anton is really unwell. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you, the dandies are really under this grind of we've failed. The label says we don't have a single. We've sold 3,000 records. We're done. Yeah. And, you know, we should have been smarter. We kind of blew it. Right. Yeah. Like both both bands are, are there's the fun. There, there's very, very funny things happening and outrageous things where you just kind of can't believe what you're seeing the whole movie. But you're right. Uh, when you when you flip over the rocks, everyone's sad. No one's satisfied with their work. No one thinks they're every. You know, I think someone literally says it. Where Courtney and Anton want to swap places. Yeah, and they they say they want to swap places, and also that Courtney just could never go all in. Oh the yeah, way Anton yes, is. Yeah. The the mantra in the band is the dandies keep saying we're well adjusted. 
and we're lucky and our right. parents still right. are married. Yes, yeah. we're the I most malicious and banned yes. in America. Yeah, yeah. The Brian Jonestown massacre are, you know, losers who make this amazing music. They're fuck ups. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, how do they, why do they tour this way? Why do they make their albums this way? Mm -hmm. And it, the film starts with them in a mutual love fest. They're right. both kind of coming up at the same time, and they both can't stop talking about the other band being the greatest band in the world. And Anton is so confident. He's he's psychotically confident, but he's saying things that are true and kind of inspiring. Like, you know, b until they can write the letter, they are just the postman. I am the letter writer writing. You know, that's great. I um I really. I really like when he's like, he seems clear eyed and he's talking almost like a prophet. That's my favorite kind of mode he gets into, and you know, and then it gets sadder and more unhinged and more druggy and, you know. He's really in love when he puts on that record for the first time for the director. And it's like, have you ever heard of the Dandy Warhols? Yeah. They're from Portland, Oregon. And the two, our two bands are going to create a revolution take over the world he says yeah he and he's looking right into the camera as he yes, plays the record yes. like yeah i'm gonna yeah. watch your life be changed that's kind of right. beautiful yes because i find music like that still i find yeah yeah i still get that resonance from music i just it yeah. gives it makes me cry it gives me the chills and yeah it's it's lovely but it does seem like at a certain point jealousy starts coming into it a bit and one of the greatest things about the film is the access. You know, there's dashboard cam footage of Courtney right. playing their new single for the first time and Anton not reacting. And you <laughs> see him has. just, yeah, yes. he seems freaked <laughs> out because I think he knows yes. it's good. Yeah, He's just taking it in. Like, how am I going to, how am I going to, how do I live now? Yeah, you see him zone out in that moment. And basically for the rest of the film, he's reacting to that one song, you could argue. Because the rest of the movie, he's he's like, we're going to make a revenge counter answer single. You know, that like dominates so much of the movie. And like one of my favorite parts is when he's like doing the artwork for their answer version. None of you are the last dandy on earth. And he's like doing voices for the <laughs> captions yes. he's written. He's like, you better get them the fuck out of there. He's just like so <laughs> doing these like corporate voices. Yes. Yeah. And but then also at the same time, it's really weird. He like they moved to Portland to try to be closer yeah. to the dandies. And that's when the dandies are kind of right. like, hey, it's fun to hang out, but I don't want you living here. Right. The footage of of uh, Anton creating music alone and basically a windowless practice studio warehouse, really tiny, is really on New Year's Eve. It's inspiring and really frightening. Yeah, I feel like I've I don't know about a New Year's Eve. That's when that footage is from. But I I res I really resonate with that footage. I'm like, oh yeah, I've been I've been the guy in that room doing that you know <laughs> yeah and now you can't tell whether the sun's coming up or down yeah i like when andy asked zia from dandies she goes did you invite or encourage bgm to move up here to portland and she just goes oh <laughs> <laughs> i bet they did um there's an amazing point in the film where they have a showcase for sire records you know who put out some yep. of the greatest independent music of all time. They're all in. Seymour Stein says with a name like that, we got to sign them. Mm -hmm. And it's just classic disaster and um, ends with a, a fist fight and Anton on the street yeah. saying somebody broke my sitar. It's one of the greatest laugh lines in the whole movie. You fucking broke my sitar, motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> and then Andy outside goes, is that blood on your hands? And he goes, yeah. From where? Oh yeah, from where he's like from <laughs> yes. other people's faces. So yeah, like in the in the movie theater with the crowd, these lines are like huge laugh moments, you know. Because it, yeah, and you can't when you see that first bite at the Viper Room, you're like, wait a second, I cannot believe she just was lucky enough to be there and capture this. Yeah, this was really the beginning of um, being able, like DV and you know mini cam, right, and being able to film 
pretty indiscreetly. There's a lot of things in this film I'm like, did that become lawsuit footage? You know, at one point, Anton, he kicks a member of the audience right. in the head and you hear it connect. Yeah. And it's really chilling. Yeah. And the film really balances out like playful manic energy of like, well, the Brian Jonestown massacre, that's why we love them. They're a disaster and you never know what you're going to get as the film goes on. It being, you know, not this, oh, charming, funny, right. like, let's see what we get yeah. kind of replacements, you know, um, shit you know show. legend built yeah. on. Yeah, shit show. And we see Anton go to jail for kicking that audience member in the head. But you're right. Like, it would. I would be fascinated to know if Andy found that particular man who's kicking the head and got permission. You know, because I because yep. she's not. I bet she didn't do what you would do today, which would be to post on the venue doors like, things are filmed in here tonight. If you enter, you're consenting to be put. You know, I bet that couldn't have been going on back then. It would be my guess. The Brian Jonestown massacre opened for Guided by Voices on a lot of our final tour in 2004. And the reason Bob asked them to be on it was because of this film. Uh huh. We all wanted to see the the Brian Jonestown massacre melt down every right. night. I think we had this really like ex like they're actually going to open. What are we going to get? Like this is going to be right. the greatest double bill of all time. These bands that have both have a massive discography. Yep. Are known for debauchery. And, you know, some shows are completely enlightened and other ones are kind of a train wreck. What was really interesting was Anton on the tour told us when I open for bands, yeah, I'm very professional and I run a tight ship and uh -huh. there was no, yeah. nothing happened the entire tour. Yeah. They were like a totally <laughs> pro band yeah. until we played the last show in LA. And Anton was yelling at the band and he turned all the amps away from the microphones facing the back of the stage so no one could hear it and was kicking people off. And then backstage, this guy, Pete Yorn, who's a musician, was there with his handler and Anton was on top of the couch screaming at him. You've got the face of a weeble wobble. <laughs> You've got the face of a weeble wobble. And Bob kind of was like, we got at least one moment. He was happy. <laughs> yeah. But again, it's not the reason I feel bad because it's they're a band with good songs. And and so I think their reputation precedes them in terms of just not knowing what you're going to get. One thousand percent. Because the next year after this movie came out, they came to Boston on their own tour, played T.T. the Bear, sold out. And everyone was waiting for that. You could feel it in the room. I think people were shouting things yeah. to try to get it too. And I remember it not happening and people leaving a little disappointment, which is disappointed, which is the is the curse of having that reputation, right? And you can and what you describe him being a pro, you can hear him at key points in this movie turn it on. Like he knows when to act like a human being. Oh, very nice to meet you. Yes, officer. You know, like you can see him like he's got the the code switching ability. Yeah, and I think he's – it's a hard thing to know when you're a musician and all of a sudden a, a major label is interested in you, how how much you need to push back. And it seems like after what the Dannys went through, everything that, that the Brian Jonestown Massacre were experiencing in real time, a bit of it I think was – a, a reflex to what they'd experienced. I think Anton was being way more protective, way more demanding, way more like, I'm going to, I'm going to make this happen for you guys, but you're going to have to work. And they seem to kind of for a while be on board with it. Mm -hmm. You know? Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. They were on the same label TVT that got it by voices was on at the time. And so I'd heard about Adam and ponytail boy, who is what Bob called the owner of, TVT and stuff. And um, yeah, you see, uh, they yeah. ended up with these two kind of amazingly prolific bands that, you know, were wanting to put out more material than they could do. Right. I mean, it's just amazing to think what a different time it was in terms of 
somebody throwing money at mm-hmm. something like that and and with complete confidence that this band could be the biggest band in the world yeah i will say though as a is an outsider as just a fan market difference between the result i mean i Guided by Voices rose to the occasion, I feel like. And those TVT albums are a step up in Sonic and a different kind of songwriting. And and so I, I think I think I think the the Bob and the band did a great job at towing that line. Like we're gonna remain ourselves. But yeah, well let's let's try and see if we can go bigger with this. And um but in the same, you know, similar contract seemed to melt down the BGM world completely. Yeah, and I think they they made, I think the Brian Jones and Massacre made some good records during that time, but they're they're long. It's the CD era, so the yeah. albums are you know 70, over sixty yeah. minutes. There's an album called "Give It Back" from yeah. 1997. Really great record, really solid. And then it starts to be like, oh, here comes the sitar jam, and it's like a jam. It's yeah. not like yeah a fully realized idea and you're like, eh, but I will say they still tour to this day. Yeah. They still sell out venues. Yeah. They have a dedicated following who have been so loyal. My wife, who's from Glasgow, when she first heard both these bands was like, well, that's been happening in the UK forever. Like this is now they're doing this, you know, it just seems so old hat. Right. But in America, that kind of Anglophile, love and you know paul mccartney bass lines and drony things and little um you know uh psycho candy magic here and you know it was still kind of refreshing yeah i like that new year's eve footage where anton's working alone and you hear him do a vocal without the music and you hear just how much british spin he's putting on he's like say goodbye to mom and dad <laughs> it cracked me up i know also you sit you mentioned sitar there's a part where does Andan say it directly he's like i can play 80 instruments oh yeah totally <laughs> the, the dandies have written off the film you know in retrospect but right. the film is full of narration by courtney taylor taylor and so right i can't imagine them really not putting their approval on it though i'm sure you know early on they signed waivers and everything but going in to do narration at the end of a film yeah. you don't feel like representing it's the you. last step <laughs> you just say fuck you yeah. you know like your film sucks and it doesn't right. represent it you're lying about how you know it was better than this because i have a quote here basically you know um you know, the Brian's Jonestown Massacre, you know, they denounced the film um, for reducing several years of hard work to at best a series of punch-ups and mis- mishaps taken out of context, and at worst, bold-faced lies and rep- misrepresentation of fact. And Courtney Taylor Taylor said, it's a movie, yeah. not a documentary. She worked her ass off and forged a plot where there was no plot. She crafted things to swell and ebb by taking eight years of us and a year and a half of the Brian's Jonestown Massacre. Do you feel like this film yeah. is a Brian Jonestown Massacre uh, film or a Dandy Warhol film? Do you feel like it leans one way or another? Well, going out, leaving the movie theater, I remember everyone felt the same way. Brian Jonestown Massacre is the hero of that movie. Dandy Warhols are, you know, the foil, if not the, or just like the, the not as cool flip version of them. Um, as I get older, as I watched it today, <laughs> you know, I respected some of the dandy's behavior. Way, you know, I just recognize what a nightmare it is to be in a B- Brian Jonestown massacre uh, for 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 anything but a visitation. It gets yes. really old really quick, you know. So, um, it's a, I don't know. In the end, it's a pretty good ad for both of them. I'd say. And um, but as far as that, you read that misre- misrepresentation of uh, the reality thing. I do have one piece of secondhand gossip about this movie, and we'll say allegedly. But I've heard that when they get pulled over in Georgia, the drugs they find were, I've heard, were Andes, and that the band had nothing on them. Allegedly, so imagine. Let's let allegedly <laughs> exactly, Chris. Let's say that's true. <laughs> But it's but it's represented how it is in the movie. Like that's that's pretty skewed. 
if you had to pick one member out of any of the members of both bands to join your band, who would you pick? Oh, it's Joel. It's absolutely Joel the Tambourine Man. <laughs> absolutely. He's, he's, yes. <laughs> I mean, you can't you can't you can't buy that kind of present. It's just like that's a that's just actually I was thinking I was joking that this movie is a great showcase for tambourine because Zia plays a lot of tambourine in the dandies too. It's just like tambourines never receive such a spotlight. But Joel is just like he's 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 a, without Joel, I'm not sure how well at least the Brian Jonestown part of this movie works. Well, I have a surprise for you. Yes. I'm going to let someone in here right now. Hold oh, on. my goodness. Hold on. So, Ryan, I want to introduce you to the lovely Travis Snyder. He's a friend who worked at the video store with me at Clinton Street Video. Um, but he was also the tour manager at Guitar Tech and ran merch for the Brian Jonestown Massacre starting in 1998 and worked with them off and on till 2008. And I wanted to bring into this Travis Snyder. And if I got it wrong, Travis slapped me on the wrist and tell us what's up. Thanks for joining us. You can hear me. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, I, 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 I worked with them. I quit in 2016. Not oh, 2008. wow. Uh, here's, this is, this is from Chris. It's, from the video store yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you sent that to me as a present uh thank you very much along with the um, snuff box and uh yodorowsky's uh holy mountain thank god yeah you were one of my first employees and you were the one i was telling ryan you were the one who gave me the pilot the mtv pilot for dig yes it was on VHS. Do you remember much about like? It, it was supposed to be. A, it was a pilot made for MTV because uh, the um, uh, Osbournes were such a success. Reality TV was new, and MTV commissioned them to to make that into a, a TV series. They made that a forty four minute pilot, um, and um, re they rejected it. <laughs> And so then they went back to going back to their original plan to make a movie. Um, it's a little different because um, they use in that in that version they 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 still included the uh, strung out heaven music. So scenes are in that that aren't in the movie because they had to cut them out because they didn't get the rights to that album because TV the record label still owned the rights to that record. But I remember on the the in the pilot there were a lot of scenes that were extended like the fight between Matt Hollywood and Anton when he's singing about love and, and he's looking right into the camera and Matt Hollywood's, you can't sing about loving yourself. If you're the only one, they just go off. And th there were certain scenes that in the movie, Courtney Taylor, Taylor's just, there's dialogue over it. And it's really frustrating because some of the best insight into the band is not included well that's how courtney is isn't he <laughs> yes so were the band excited about it when it was a pilot uh i don't i don't think they were ever excited about this footage being put out there yeah and when i say the band i mean anton yeah you know because yeah. he is the band uh yeah. joel, joel and most of the other bands they they're 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 eager for any fame and publicity and and they they Probably too much, so they they, you know, agree to do, participate in things that maybe they should not. Right. But um, you know, I mean, I mean, Anton ultimately lent the mu the rights to the music, and it has definitely helped the band's career and helped his career, despite how it paints him. Mm. So, yeah, he's kind of got a very uh, difficult position there, <laughs> feeling about the whole thing. You know, it's it's. It's not something he likes, but but it 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 changes life for sure. So for better and worse. Right. Yeah, we were saying earlier how how I left the theater seeing the movie and just immediately starting the hunt for those CDs. <laughs> well, those yeah, when when CDs. we were driving, um, we were dr on tour and we were driving from uh, to New York. We were going through Pennsylvania, the Poconos. 
uh, when we stopped at a Burger King and we, I got a call from um, this photographer, Mary Martley, and uh, Anton got a call from the A&R rep, Adam, Adam Shore, from TVT at the same time saying that it won Sundance. And we were shocked. We were, we were thought, <laughs> we didn't think Andy could make a good movie, period. I still don't believe she's a good filmmaker. Sorry, <laughs> Andy. But she's won two, two um, Sundance awards, you know, two documentaries back to back, but, but whatever. Um, at the time, it didn't seem like it was possible. Um, and we finished our drive and we got to New York the mercury lounge on houston yeah and there was a line of people waiting outside that flew in from sundance like couldn't believe that that we still existed and we're actually on the road and they had to see it for themselves i mean we pulled up and we we're confused we'd never seen a line outside of one of our venues before at two in the afternoon you know it was very bizarre so it must have been hard for anton though because part of it was people wanting the potential spectacle of the show falling apart or seeing Anton, you know, at his worst rather than people who were there to just love the music. Was that a hard thing to, to, to tour on? Absolutely. Uh, there was, um, a lot, a lot of years there, you know, through the next three or four years where it was just lots of jerks coming to the show and yelling insults, trying to create violence trying to antagonize the band and, and cause fights because that's what they saw in the movie and they wanted to see the movie instead of the show, you know, and it really sucked for uh, several years, but uh, the popular the band grew and uh, that kind of got drowned out eventually, but it, it, it took a few years. And you're in the film, you're on, you're in the film when they go to uh, Japan. Uh, I yeah. Was really... yeah. I'm, I'm actually, um, it's a tiny picture on the back of the box, but on the inside, there's there's a picture even that one. Yep. I'm right. There. <laughs> <laughs> That's a picture of the fan. I'm even, and that picture is very tiny on the back of the box. So I made it to the, I made it to the box of the DVD. I'm only in the movie for about seven seconds or something. It's not a lot. It's just one quick thing. Now, as someone who, who was who was there for so many years and, you know, part of the making of it, any particular things you feel are like this is directly misrepresented? You know, any any specific complaints, either from you or the band? Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, the, the whole um, the whole movie is not true. It's 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 a fictional story. Um, she she had to edit it that way to make a movie. Uh, basically, they the whole movie only follows the BGM for about two years and follows the dandies for about seven years. Oh, see, we read a quote and we, we were just before you got on, I was so skeptical because that to me seemed like something Courtney would just say, like, of course they filmed us for eight years and only them for, I, so I was, you know, kind of making light of it, oh. but it's true. Well, they, I think I'm, they filmed us a lot more than that, but they, but for story wise, like they, dragged out our two years of footage and mix it in with their eight years of footage or seven years of footage. okay so so like um the, when matt hollywood quits the band is not where they say it is like we in the movie we go to japan and then he quits but he quit like he quit like a full year before we went to japan he wasn't there in japan okay um he he actually quit the band and and then went on a two-month tour with us and then helped the next bass player lived with Anton afterwards and helped the next bass player learn the parts, you know? So, you know, it's, 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 it, it makes it look like there's a lot more animosity at the time than there was. Uh -huh. And uh, they have the timeline all weird and, and all, uh, Anton being arrested and all that stuff that happened in two, you know, 2003 you know that, that uh -huh. happened that that's the only footage like later like they just cut from like 1988 to five years later him having this kind of meltdown that's kind of amazing because you know both ryan and myself have watched this film so many times and i've never i've just always believed it <laughs> i've always right. believed the oh. timeline i've always believed the back and forth and it just kind of shows um kind of the 
power of something like this to create uh, whatever narrative anyone wants. It really, it really has affected how I watch all documentaries now because I just, I just, I know that you got to. It's a difference between telling a story, telling the truth, and making a good film. You know, you you have mm -hmm. to kind of shuffle things around, and I'm sure it's more common than not for any documentary to do that. It, it never occurred to me either until I was in one and went, "Wait, that never happened. That never happened. That's not how that worked. That's not the order that this happened." It's, was the fact that uh, that uh, sorry, uh, Andy? Yeah, Andy Timoney knows. Uh, they everyone knows she's filming these two bands. Did the fact that she's filming those two bands spur everybody on to talk about the other one way more than they naturally would have? Is she kind of fostering that friendship slash feud? I I would guess so. Um, by the t I I they she started filming uh, in them in like ninety six or seven probably late 96 and and I didn't start with the band till early 98. Right. So all that's that whole tour with the, you know, Pete, uh, Pete from black rebel. And, um, that, that was before my time. Mm -hmm. Um, I came in, uh, after they had recorded strong out in heaven, which they weren't allowed to use those songs. And so that's another reason why I'm not in the movie much. Cause I came in during the part they weren't allowed to use. Were you close to the dandy people at all? <laughs> the dandies are fine. <laughs> <They're>, <laughs> I, I was, I they allowed me to hang out with them, basically, you know, I because of who I worked for. They right. didn't like me. And sometimes the feeling was mutual. Some, you know, sometimes we liked each other. Sometimes we didn't. It was, it was, a little, they're, they're fine. They're fine. They're, god bless them and what they're doing you know yeah. but <laughs> i don't want to get it into some sort of spat with any of them they're, there's nothing wrong with them they're doing yeah. what they're doing and they're succeeding and that's great yeah both bands yeah. very active still seems to me yeah yeah the dandies uh dandies just played in detroit with the high strong who used to be on tvt and did a tour of this and and uh, that's great you were on that guided by voices brian jonestown massacre tour yeah and that was a really professional tour. It was like they just played well. It was like a tight ship. Every, you know, Anton was just fine. But like behind the scenes, was it, what was that like? You, you don't remember like Frankie, just he would just lay on the floor in the venues during sound checks and scream about how he doesn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> no, I don't remember, <laughs> don't remember that, that at shit? all. But I mean, we were not. Oh my God. It... A Anton was very well behaved that tour. He was. he was actually kind of our, he was actually a ringleader trying to constantly cheer us up. We were all the ones who were de depressed and unhappy. And Anton was very positive on that trip. So. Yeah, I remember that. I think we were, you know, we, we, the bands didn't really hang out that much together. Not too much, except Anton and Pollard. Yeah, exactly. They, so, they, they you know, drink, they would drink a bottle each together at, at the end of the set. Yeah. And they would, you know, Anton would tell us, I just want to be a professional. And, you know, when I, when I open for bands, yeah. I want to be, you know, really on top of it. But yeah, I don't remember uh, the rest of the band and yourself being like, oh, this sucks. It, tend it tended to be Anton would be a, Anton would be a, a very good at wrangling us to, in trying to boost, you know, cheer up, cheer everybody up when, when things were dark, if, if things weren't dark, then he would go dark. It was always uh -huh. one or the other. It'd be like, if we're all having a good time, he would be, a jerk and if we're all having a bad time he'd be he'd step up and try to make it better it's it's, it's weird like that <laughs> is that just his makeup or was it calculated or i think so because it happened a lot i remember we were driving into a hurricane uh we we're trying to get to houston uh from georgia or florida or somewhere so we're crossing you know new orleans and all that and everyone's evacuating and it, it's back, bumper to bumper traffic going the opposite direction. And we're the only people on the road <laughs> heading straight in. And, and, and he was like, just riling us up going, he, he was going, come on, Frankie, Travis, sing Ebony and Ivory for me. And so we started singing Ebony and Ivory <laughs> as we're driving into the middle of a hurricane, you know, and he, he'd always be positive like that. It was kind of funny. So I think it's part of his nature. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of footage of the dandies and I, I'm assuming this is all shot shot later, but you know, they paint the Brian Jonestown massacre as like unlucky. We're lucky 
they're not we're well adjusted they're not and you know it seems like you know in the end they're just like like every band is a mess you know yes yes exactly every every band <laughs> is some kind of dysfunctional family being in a band is, is will, will wreck you yeah. it's it's hard especially when you when you yeah i don't know what's worse you know driving around in a in a minivan you know with no help whatsoever you know and no sleep and no hotels or having a bus in hotels then it just becomes boring it's like it's it's like it's horrible but then you miss the horrible you know and it, and then you feel like your shows stink because they're just boring because you don't have that anger and energy anymore it's weird so I don't know. I don't know the answer to that. <laughs> so how did you wrap up with the band? Oh, um, <laughs> again, um, the manager at the time, starting right before uh, he kind of helped Ted Gardner, he, he kind of helped um, negotiate the rights to this movie. He came in right then. We didn't have a manager. Anton fired his manager right before we went to Tokyo in 98 or 99. Like, because the because the manager was going to go instead of me and Anton fired him so that I could go. Um, but he, I don't want to say anything that'll get me sued. Um, but that manager, yeah, that that didn't, that that wasn't a good situation anyway. Um, and then we had no manager for a couple, several years. And then he got Ted Gardner, who was um, one of the co-creators of Lollapalooza, uh, former manager for Jane's Addiction. And at that time, and that's him and Perry Farrell created that. And he was also the manager of Tool for a while. Um, a lot of heroin bands. <laughs> so he came in to be our heroin manager. Um but uh, he and I did not uh, really like each other. Right. And he, I, yeah, I, and, you know, partially because I didn't like him and I would yell about how much I didn't like him all the time on tour and to Anton and it made things uncomfortable. Um, but uh, then we got it, we were in 2016, we were about, to, they were planning a, another American and U European tour. Mm. And, Ted Ted said that he they wouldn't be needing me for the European part. You know, he yeah. was squeezing me out. And I wrote to Anton and said that this is what Ted's saying. And Anton just was wrote back some crazy stuff about our keyboard player being an idiot or something. And I was just in a weird place in my life. And I just went, well, I'm done. You know, I don't want to get into a fight and fight for this. If Anton isn't going to tell his manager to just knock it off. I'm not, I don't want to fight anymore. Yeah. I'm done. I'm old. <laughs> yeah. So I just went, oh, I'm quitting then. Like, I'm not going to just, I can't just keep quitting jobs to go on tours. And if I'm only going to make enough money to do the Europe, US tour, not the European yeah. money too, it's not, it's just too, just messes up my life too much. So I, I was, I can't, I can't just do part of a tour and make a couple thousand dollars and, you know, give everything up for that and restart yeah. over again, you know, yes. possibly lose my home and everything. So I was like, enough's right. enough. I'm tired. And that's probably best for everybody, you know? But yeah. I always say that in things like me, you know, when I was in God of My Voices, you and, you know, branches and mass crime, I always just sum it up as saying, well, I served. Yeah. I, I enlisted. I served. Did my time. Then yeah. <laughs> it is a lot like military in your camaraderie, and it's also a lot like prison in a way. So yeah, serving is always a good term, either with whatever meaning. It's all water under the bridge. I'm happy where I am. <laughs> I'm yeah. glad to be done with it. I went down and saw them a couple, uh, First Avenue a couple times, and it, before I moved out of Portland at the Wonder Ballroom, every we all I get along great with them. I brought, they brought me on the bus this last spring when they were in town and it it was it just reeked of urine and and it was filthy and I just looked around and went god I can't imagine how I did this for 
next 18 years. Like, and I could never <laughs> go back. This is like right, fucked up. Right. Like when you're in it, you don't notice yeah. how crazy it is. But when you're, when you walk in from a, after several years of separation, you just go, what the fuck was, is this? Yeah. And also you were, you, you had to take care of shit so that they could live their life. Yes. I had to take care of, literally I had to take care of the shit. <laughs> Every time, every time we had to empty the toilet, I was the one who had to do it. The bus driver would yell at me, okay, it's the middle of the night, no one's around, pull the plug, and I'd have to run back and empty the shit into the, not the shit, urine, onto the freeway illegally. Because <laughs> that was my job. Well, that's why I wanted to talk to you. <laughs> yeah. It's nuggets like that. And, and we've all been in things with multiple members coming and going, and that creates a different dynamic, too, when there's always um you just don't know the people who are coming and going that well either right well we were pretty stable i mean the band fell apart in 2018 the couple years after i quit yeah. um that's when there was the mass exodus a lot a few were fired a few quit and and but i think with a band like jonestown New blood is always good. That's what I told Joel. He he was a little weirded out with having a bunch of new people they didn't know and traveling around with them. But I think uh, with that kind of, when you're only playing like two chords, a song, you need to have an energy to it. And if you're doing it for 12 years, it's it's hard to switch from A to E with any enthusiasm after a while. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, you need someone with slightly different licks just to... Yeah, yeah. Right. It's just so I think I think it's probably better for the band too that we had a kind of a shift change, you know, and brought new blood in. I appreciate you both taking the time to talk to me about this. I, I always ask this question at the end of every interview and I change it every time a little. But on a scale from one to ten, with one being the lowest scale and ten being the highest, how many broken sitars do you give this film? Ryan, I'll start with you. How many broken sitars do you give this film on a scale from one to 10? As a movie, 10. As a documentary, everything we're learning, maybe a, a 6.5. <laughs> sounds fair. Interesting. Travis? I, I think that sounds pretty fair. I mean, I mean, it is a good movie. It is it is entertaining um and and informative about the um music business and and what it's like you know the just the misery of being on the road and the struggles of trying to do that with no money and no and anything it's 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 good it's it should be seen by everyone they should show it in schools <laughs> <laughs> they should starting with you yeah. so yes. uh i i want to thank you both for being on revolutions per movie you're both two of my favorite people so that means a lot thank you so much oh, thanks chris thank you very nice to meet you yeah nice to meet you thank you for listening to revolutions per movie we release new episodes every thursday so be sure to search for the show on your favorite podcast app and subscribe to the show and if you've enjoyed this it would mean a lot to me if you would rate and review it as well you can follow us on social media at revolutions per movie and also find out more information about our various guests in the episode show notes. Thanks again, and we'll see you next week. Bye!